Please be seated. Well, if you were here on Monday night, you know that the threshold for amazing seems to keep rising at Calvary. I was among the slack-jawed crowd listening to those stunning boy choristers of St. Paul's London, which meant that when Ardell and I met Ben and Michael, the two boys who'd been assigned to stay at our house, it was a little, li- a little like having Mick Jagger and Keith Richards stop by for the evening, <laughs> except they were 11 and sober and, uh, and cute, actually. Um, we were just a couple of groupies who desperately wanted to make a good impression on these international celebrities, right? So, so when we got to the house, we offered them ice cream, Ben and Jerry's, no less. But after we'd set a heaping bowl in front of each of them, I opened up the envelope we were given, which contained, we were told, the operating instructions for an authentic English choir boy. And it was there that I discovered, to my horror, that we were supposed to limit Ben's sugar intake. (laughs) You know the term catastrophize? (laughs) Catastrophizing is when you suddenly become convinced that, for example... Not only is the choir boy you've just given ice cream to about to go into full-on insulin shock, but that his bowl of brownie batter core will probably cause his vocal cords to seize, and when they do relax, they will have dropped, his voice will have dropped two octaves. <laughs> Fortunately for us, that did not happen. The boys polished off their dessert, apparently no worse for the transgression, Then we took them upstairs to show them the room where they would be staying, and it was Ben, who actually stands nearly a full head taller than Michael, who admitted that he might just be a little scared of the dark sometimes. So we tried a few different lighting schemes. In the end, a small lamp over in the corner was bright enough to keep the ghoulies at bay for Ben and dim enough to let poor Michael fall asleep. You know, maybe these two really were 11-year-old human children after all. Ben actually confirmed this for us when he noticed a small stuffed bear on a shelf and said, "Uh, Excuse me, might I have a teddy? (laughs) We tucked the boys in with the teddy he'd spotted, a stuffed dog named Bishop, and a sock monkey who is at least as old as I am. Such are the basic tools for survival, it seemed, even for these famed choristers of St. Paul's London when they find themselves in strange beds far away from home. And learning how to fend off the loneliness is an essential life skill for all of us, is it not? Even for the most impressive and intimidating among us. I had been thinking about loneliness when I read our gospel for this week. And it brought me into these familiar images from a very different angle. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to catastrophize my scripture reading at times. If there's a reference to anything being cast into a fire, I think it has to be about hell. At first blush, the gist of John 15 seems to be, bear fruit or else you're going to get it. (laughs) But Jesus is using this very old biblical metaphor of the vine to remind us of something that is very essential to our lives, I think, not to scare us out of hell. Before we get too far off into the passage, we should note what one commentator points out to us about vines. They're not really like trees, are they? Most trees we know have a larger trunk and the limbs and branches jut out from there, right? It's easy to tell the trunk from the branches, but a vine is kind of a tangle of branches. A vine consists of its branches, you might say. Keep this in mind as Jesus begins. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. So to begin with, Jesus is not talking about some category of sinner branches out there in the world. He's talking to people whose lives are embedded in his like vines, twisted into each other like in a vineyard. Abide in me, he says, as I abide in you. There's something so intimate in the, that the abiding seems to be a two-way activity, almost mutual. In fact, it may be difficult to tell vines from branches. They're all so intertwined. 
And that's how Jesus describes our relationship to God and to Him. It's not Jesus the great cedar of Lebanon and us the spindly little twigs sprouting out weakly from Him. He chooses this vine metaphor, one in which the whole is nothing but all the parts abiding completely in each other. He chooses a metaphor in which it's hard to tell the Jesus part from the people part. We are all so wonderfully entangled. So we need to name this deep inclusion and the embeddedness of our lives in the life of God before we even get to the pruning part, don't we? And then we should notice that the pruning happens first in the, as the pruning not of dead and useless branches, it's the pruning of all the fruit-bearing branches so that they'll be even better connected and bear even more fruit into the world. We all have parts of our lives that God may need to prune away so we'll flourish a little more fully, right? I'd be glad for a few destructive habits, petty obsessions, envy, pride, plenty more, to be lopped off and thrown in some fire. Pruning is first what happens to a healthy branch. And it's only after driving home how we just can't abide in ourselves by ourselves. Driving home how our lives are so tangled up in the life of God and vice versa that Jesus says our whole being will wither if we let ourselves get disconnected from the source of our lives. He says that in the same way that those small and damaged parts of ourselves need to be trimmed away, our whole being depends on this connection to the living vine. In other words, it's really just a truth about life that we can't go it alone. The language about lopping off limbs and brush pile fires may seem harsh, but lives really are at stake because we live like vines. We can't be ourselves all by ourselves. We will wither. So do you see why this passage might have lit up for me in a new way when I'd been thinking about loneliness? I'd been thinking about it ever since reading a piece by David Brooks in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. Interestingly, the title of the article makes no mention of loneliness. It was called The Blindness of Social Wealth. His broader point was that the most important sources of wealth in our lives are our relationships and our connections to other people. And when we have plenty of these healthy relationships, their importance is often invisible to us, as are the people who don't have so much in the way of social wealth. Then he provides a lot of sobering statistics. In the 1980s, 20% of Americans said they were often lonely. Now twice as many do. Depression rates have increased tenfold since the 1960s, a rise that can't be explained away by better reporting. Our satisfaction with peer-to-peer -peer relationships at work has been in decline for 30 years. A former Surgeon General said, during my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. Weak social connections have health effects similar to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, we're told. Other studies show correlations between our attachments to our screens and our detachment from sustaining friendships. An eighth grader who uses social media heavily is 25% more likely to be depressed. We could go on. Mr. Brooks says, I summarize all this because loneliness and social isolation are the problems that undergird many of our other problems. More and more Americans are socially poor, and yet it's very hard for the socially wealthy even to see this fact. It is the very nature of loneliness and social isolation to be invisible. We talk as if the lonely don't exist. Or to use another time's metaphor, Maybe branches have become disconnected from one another and from God and are withering, maybe even going up in flames all around us. Doesn't this sound like something Christians might care about? I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I am them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. I don't mean to reduce the gospel to self-help. In fact, it's just the opposite. The gospel is that there's really no such thing as self-help in the end. 
Our help, even our help from God, happens in this tangle of vines and branches God has woven each of us into. And death comes when any of us thinks we can exist all on our own. This may sound like a grim warning, but turn it around. Imagine a community of people who really believe Jesus when he says our very life comes from this interconnected tangle of branch and vine. Wouldn't we naturally be a community who saw reconciling the lonely to the sustaining relationships we all depend on as pretty essential work? In fact, maybe it would be a community who makes no distinction between welcoming the stranger and fostering fellowship with one another. Because we all need this essential connection to the source of our lives. And we make this connection to God sometimes in the simplest, most human of exchanges, sharing a meal or a pew or a song, looking another person in the eye as if she matters, engaging in conversation with someone who confuses or offends us, wondering how we might stay connected somehow. I know so many people whose lives have been saved through their relationships with Calvary Church. Branches have found their attachment to the Drew Vine through you, and you've been that attachment for me already. I also know people who have struggled to make a connection here, have told me about how wonderful the life of Calvary is, but also of difficulties finding their way in. I actually don't see this as a criticism and a failure so much as an opportunity and an invitation to us. Because in an age of loneliness, maybe tending to all the spaces where relationships might be made has never been more urgent. Maybe especially now, we need to keep asking how we can make sure that the sustaining relationships we depend on are nurtured and how they're made available to other people who need them. Strange as it sounds, Something as odd and old-fashioned as face-to-face -face Sunday church may have never been so necessary to so many lives. Well, hearing that Ben needed a teddy made him a lot more human to us that night. Brilliant as those two boys were, they were just as susceptible to loneliness and fear as any of us are. The life-saving difference was at the ripe old age of 11, Ben knew to reach out and ask for what he needed. And thanks be to God, we still had a stuffed animal or two to spare. It is true that the gospel can be as costly as the cross at times. But someday Jesus may be calling us first simply to open ourselves to the simplest of human connections, ordinary relationships that are still the openings of the grace of God, the grace of God uses to enter our lives, and openings in us where the grace escapes and finds its way maybe into a withering branch nearby.